Benvenuti a tutti, and welcome to another edition of Italian America Long Island. My name is Dave Anthony Sutta Ducati. You know, we've been privileged to have so many different Italian Americans who are so proud of their Italian heritage from all different walks of life. We've had musicians, we've had singers, we've had politicians, lawyers, cooks, winemakers, so many different types of people. Today, we're privileged to have a good friend of mine who happens to be a Shakespearean scholar. Mike, welcome to the show. Thanks, Dave. Mike, uh, you have a very, very uh, big history uh, with the Folger Library. I know that you, you've taught Shakespeare courses in 38 states as well as Canada and England. You've been a senior consultant to the uh, National Education uh, uh, Center for the Folger Library in Washington. You're the author of three books, and you've been consultant and editors uh, on, in many magazines about Shakespeare. How did you get involved with Shakespeare? How did you start? Good question. Um, I started, uh, actually I started my real connection when, when I started teaching. Uh, and as you know, we, we taught together, and, and uh, because I was teaching, uh, I guess what grade it was at the time, but we were, you know, I had to teach a Shakespeare play, and, and I didn't quite know how to do it, but I figured it out and, 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 and worked it. And then uh, about halfway through my career, I got, uh, uh, I applied for an institute in Washington at the Folger Shakespeare Library, and, uh, and I was accepted. So it was a four week program that um, was sponsored by the National Endowment for the Humanities. And uh, at that time, um, so I spent four weeks in Washington learning co completely different approaches on how to teach Shakespeare. Uh, and that's how I sort of started. And then uh, I, I kept getting involved with them and they kept asking me to come back to be um, what they called a master teacher and do different, different aspects of different programs. Uh, and, uh, and when I returned to the classroom, after after that, uh, and that was in 1986. When I returned to the classroom after that, uh, my teaching of Shakespeare was very different. Uh, and uh, and as I said, I just kind of kept getting invited back to do more work, and then workshops all over the country started, and, and that's where I am today. So right after your first involvement, where well, you were a student actually at the at the Folger Library. Ah, uh, yeah. And then they invited you back. Right. Immediately after the. Uh... Yeah. Yeah. So uh, in in 1989, I'm sorry, 1988, uh, we we went back for four weeks to study to create some materials, some books, and we created this series of Shakespeare books for teachers called Shakespeare Set Free. Uh, these three different volumes of it. So I worked on that as well, uh, and then and then it just sort of you know continued from there. Uh, but so, and they, as I said, they kept inviting me back. In 1990, with the Folger, we did a work. We did a, an institute where we brought 30 American teachers to England to study, uh, and we worked with uh, about 25 British teachers uh, from uh, from England, and, and st spent uh, the half of the summer in Sh Shakespeare's town of Stratford and Avon. And then they all came back to Washington, so I was worked with that group as well. Well. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what the Folger Library is? Is this, is this uh, like a museum of coffee or something like this? Or no. Does it have anything to do with the coffee? No, it has nothing to do with the coffee. Uh, the Folger coffee guy is is the uh, a distant cousin, I believe, of uh, Henry Folger. Henry Clay Folger, who founded the library, uh, uh, was uh, he started with very humble beginnings uh, in Brooklyn, uh, and he. Uh, he and his uh, his wife uh, were very interested in Shakespeare, and he uh, his roommate uh, sort of got him a job at Standard Oil. And before so, before long, he was the president and chairman of Standard Oil of New York, um, working with the Rockefellers and and such. Uh, and he just collected everything he could about Shakespeare because he was fascinated by it, as was his wife. Uh, and they kept everything in a huge storehouse, several storehouses actually in Brooklyn. Uh, they had an apartment in Brooklyn that they rented. They didn't even own their own apartment, but they rented. Uh, and they just bought up uh, these in incredibly uh, rare materials uh, about Shakespeare, uh, materials uh, connected to him. Uh, and then the story, the story goes, they were in Washington changing trains at Union Station, and they kind of did a walk. And they were looking at where they were going to build a library. They had an idea that they would build a library to give, give these books and this material to the American people. Uh, so they uh, they came up uh, they, they kind of wandered around uh, 
the Capitol Hill area, and they saw this lovely spot. Of course, there were houses on it at the time, and they said, "Oh, yeah, we can put it right here." Uh, and they they uh, had a meeting with the with you know the, the city officials and all of that, and they got permission to build it there. Uh, he bought up all the all the houses that were on the street, moved those people somewhere. We don't know where, but uh, and uh, and eventually built the library. What time period are we talking? About? They're talking about the 1930s, uh, well, 19 yeah late 1920s and, and early 1930s, uh, and. Um, he unfortunately died before the library opened, but his wife lived on and, and, uh, and was really good there. Uh, it's an unusual library, and when I first got involved with there, I was very, uh, I was very confused because when I hear the word library, as most people do, it's like the word public is usually in front of it, yeah. uh, or university is in front of it. So, uh, but this is not a public library; it's a private library, uh, private in the sense that. Um, one, if one wants to go do research there, you need to have a reason and you need to apply. And the application process is pretty simple if you're, uh, if you're an English professor or, or, or somebody who is studying uh, Shakespeare and, on a serious level. And Mike, you mentioned that uh, they were collecting materials. Mm -hmm. now, what do you mean by materials? I, I'm thinking, when I think of library, I think of books. Right. But obviously, it's more than just books that are there. What are the, some of the things that you would find in a fall July? Right? So right. So so the the major part of the collection is well, two things. First of all, uh, most people don't realize this, but we there there are no plays, there are no Shakespeare plays that are written in his handwriting. No manuscripts of the original plays that he wrote uh, in his handwriting. Um, they Not even in England. Nowhere. No, they don't exist. exist. Well, I shouldn't say they don't exist. We don't know if they exist, but and, and everybody at the Folger keeps hoping that someday they'll find something in somebody's attic or something. But as far as we know, uh, and, and trust me, people have been looking, there are no copies of his plays in his handwriting. Uh, but what there are are uh, books that were published uh, many during his lifetime, uh, individual single copies of plays. Uh, some of them didn't even have his name on them, but eventually uh, they did. Uh, and then after he died, he dies in 1616, and seven years later, uh, in 1623, uh, his good friends publish uh, a complete works. So they collect all of these plays, some of which had been published before and some of which hadn't, uh, and they create this book called The First Folio which is a it's very rare book. And we, we, one of the things that Henry Folger uh, and Emily Folger did is collect as many of these as they could. So we have 82 copies of it. And How many were, copies were there printed? Uh, they're not sure. They think maybe about 800, 900. There are, uh, there are 240 some in the, in the world that exist. The second most copies are in Japan, the library in Japan, where the Japanese love Shakespeare. Wow. Yeah. And we have 82 here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so then in addition to that, they, they collected a lot of, of other material related to Shakespeare or related to the times. Uh, they have tons and tons of manuscripts by other people, letters, documents, uh, all sorts of uh, all sorts of odd material, uh, as well as costumes. Oh, they do. They have Costumes. They have, oh yeah, lots of artifacts. Costumes. Uh, they have... Uh, Oh, just weird kind of stuff. That they have these tchotchkes, what we call them, these little statues, that, you know, porcelain kind of things they collected, uh, and and artwork, tons and tons of, of paintings uh, and and stuff like that. So this, so it's, it's a really rich collection of material. So would these paintings and tchotchkes be like of Shakespearean characters, mm -hmm. or, or some of them were? Sure, sure, uh, yes, very much, very often. Uh, and we, even though it's a private library, there's a public area that is open on display for the public. So, uh, and we're located right across from the Library of Congress and the Supreme Court, just behind uh, the uh, U.S. Capitol. Uh, and there's a, a giant, what they call the Great Hall, that's open to the public, and there's always displays on there of this rare material. So they'll bring it up and put it in cases and, and demonstrate it and show it off. So um, uh, it, that's what we that's what we do. Now you're. You had been a teacher, of course, because mm -hmm. we taught together for so many years mm -hmm. uh, at Farmingdale High School, mm -hmm. rah-rah, Taylor's go. <laughs> uh, uh, how much of your time now do you spend with the Folger Library, and do you spend a lot of time on the premises of the library? Or? Yeah, uh, I travel there maybe once a month uh, if I'm not on the road for them doing, doing work other places. Uh, and, uh, and, I'm, and we do a lot of work on the phone and on computers. So uh, I would say, you know, I, I, it's hard to estimate because it, it varies, but uh, quite a few times, you know, I'm, I'm on all day, I'm on every day doing something or other for them. Okay. We, have, we generally have a lot of staff meetings. There's one um, 
going on actually as we speak <laughs> uh, that I that uh, uh, that that I would attend as well. So we do these kind of online uh, on the phone meet meetings. Okay, so what is your role with the Forge Your Library now? You so, so my about? role is, is uh, I'm a senior consultant on national education. So what that means is all of the projects that go beyond the Washington, D.C. area on, are, are stuff that I deal with. Uh, and it's, so it may be a conference. We're doing a conference coming up in, in St. Louis. Uh, whether it's um, doing these workshops around the country, uh, anything that's beyond. And, and, and the major thing that we have now is a, a new... Um, uh, community website for teachers that uh, that teachers can go on and, and share material and stuff. So that's what I've been working on right now. So you've traveled mm -hmm. quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Now, when you travel for the library, what do you do? What what's the purpose of your travel? So most of the work that we do in, at the education department involves teachers rather than students. Our philosophy is that if we can teach teachers how to teach Shakespeare and get kids excited about it. Uh, that's it's, it's better to work with a teacher who will reach so many so many students as opposed to uh, what some theaters do is they'll work and they'll send an actor into a classroom and that, and that actor will work mm -hmm. with kids and then leave and, and it's like a one shot so we, we think there's more longevity in that so we created a lot of material we're going to be creating a whole series of new books uh, specifically designed for teachers to show them tricks on not tricks but uh, techniques on how to make Shakespeare more effective and more interesting to the students and uh, what what was one of the most notable trips that you made, uh, or most memorable? Uh, probably, probably the one in England. Uh, uh, and I, I've been to England now several times, but uh, going to Shakespeare's birthplace and going to Shakespeare's house and uh, and and working in, in those buildings as well, which it was really ter terrific. Uh, and of course now there's the Globe Theatre in London, uh, which is which is. Uh, a, a, a replica of the, glo the original globe, uh, and we've been there as well doing work. So it's been quite good. Now, so many of Shakespeare's works are set in Italy. I happen to have a list. Why don't you tell us a, few, <laughs> a little bit about that? You know, what, why did he so often set right. his work in Italy? You talk about that and tell us what the plays are. And so, 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 right. So, so there are people out there, and, and, and most scholars disagree with them. Who think that there's a possibility that Shakespeare spent time in Italy? Uh, uh, there's a, there's a period in his life which they refer to as the dark uh, the uh, the dark ages. Not, uh, yeah, the dark ages where we don't quite know what he was doing, right? There was a, a period of a couple of years. So so that's one of the one of the theories. Uh, the, uh, most people think that he was influenced by material that he'd been reading. Uh, the, the, the Italians were publishing stuff. Uh, one of the one of the uh, one of his main sources, and, and I was going to talk about this, is uh, his name is, I'll, I'll read you his name, Francesco Petrarca. Uh, we refer to him as Petrarch, and Petrarch uh, wrote, uh, created the, the, a form for the sonnets that Shakespeare then modified and used. Uh, so he was very influenced by that. Uh, a lot of the plays uh, were written. Uh, there's, there's a play, a play, I guess to Othello is a play called Cynthia, an Italian play that he read. So, so a lot of the stuff was being translated into English, and the English were very, uh, very excited about about anything that had to do with Italy. It was it was exotic. Uh, so, so I, we think that that's why he, he said it in as opposed to as opposed to England. Uh, and the reality is, except for the history plays, which you know King Richard and, and Henry's, which take place in, in England and London. Just nearly every other play is set outside of outside of England. Outside um, of England. Yeah. So, so how many plays are set in Italy? Uh, well, let me give you the list. So I'll, I'm not going to go through the, t the towns because some of your viewers might know these towns. Okay. Or certainly will. So uh, uh, there's a play called All Wells, All's Well That Ends Well, and that's set in Florence. Okay. Um, there's a, Anthony and Cleopatra, which you may have heard of, is, is uh, set in Rome, but also in Messina. Uh, and characters, some of these, some of these are not necessarily set there, but the characters are from there. Mm -hmm. uh, a play called Coriolanus, which is set in Rome. A play called Cymbeline, which is set in Rome. Uh, the uh, uh, Julius Caesar, of course, Rome. Okay. Uh, the Merchant of Venice. Can you guess where that's set? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good. Uh, uh, Much Ado About Nothing was set in Messina. So now we're in Sicily land. Uh, Othello is set in Venice. Uh, Romeo and Juliet. Do you know where that's set? Verona. Verona, exactly. Okay. Uh, the Taming of the Shrew takes place in Padua. Uh, Titus Andronicus, one of my favorite plays, set in Rome. Uh, here's another one for you. 
if you can guess the answer. Two gentlemen of Verona. What do you think that's set? Oh, that's obviously <laughs> got to be in Bali. Right. Uh, the Winter's Tale is Sicily. It's referred to as Sicilia uh, in the in the uh, play. And the comedy, uh, the Tempest. The Tempest has characters from Milan uh, in it, uh, even though it takes oh, place. Is that Prospero? Is mm -hmm. the Duke of Milan? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and and the Comedy of Errors uh, has characters that come from Syracuse. Syracuse, uh, and uh, so so, yeah, it's it's really fascinating to see all of these Italian stories come up. So there's a real Italian connection between uh, yeah. between Shakespeare. There's some there's some wackos out there who who are convinced that Shakespeare was actually Italian. Which, I would, think which it's I would be very highly <laughs> probable. <laughs> which I would like to be to know that that's true. Yeah. But but so here's the other thing about Shakespeare, which which sort of is why there's all these new theories, is that we don't know uh, a lot about him. We, we have very little information about his life. Um, it, it just wasn't recorded. It wasn't, it wasn't something that people did. So now, Michael, why do you think the, the teaching of Shakespeare is relevant today? I mean, we are in the digital age. He's from the 15th century. Mm -hmm. uh, so how does that f find relevance to today's kids? Because the, story, the stories are, are very relevant. Um, right now, there's... Uh, there's two plays that we're looking at a lot based on what's been going on in, in the world and, and, uh, and, and talking about teaching them. One is, uh, for instance, The Merchant of Venice uh, is set in, um, in Venice, obviously, and it deals with, with Shylock, uh, the Jew, who is uh, a victim in the play of anti-Semitism. Uh, and then Othello, uh, which is uh, the African uh, Moor, uh, Othello, the black man in, in, in this lovely uh, setting who marries a white woman. And that becomes, so there's a lot of, of racism in, built into that. Uh, it's not that Shakespeare was racist, but the, the play deals with racism. So, so for those two examples alone are very relevant to, to today's world and to their students, uh, and they get it. Uh, and, and the rest of the plays as well. I mean, good teachers know how to bring that stuff to life for, for their students. Amazing stuff. Yeah. Amazing stuff. Now, to your knowledge, uh, is Shakespeare taught in Italy? That's a good question. I don't know. I don't know. But I should go there and, and, and I think that the Folgers should sponsor <laughs> you to go to Italy, uh, you and some of your best friends who may have TV shows. <laughs> and uh, You can we'll, follow me we'll, with the camera. We'll, yes, we'll, we'll do a special on location in Italy Tracing Shakespeare. Do you, has he been translated? He's been into translated Italy? into like 80 something languages, I think. Uh, and and uh, so, yeah, uh, and I know, as I said, it, it, it's performed all over the place, but I don't, I don't know much about um, the current situation in Italy. Probably not. Probably not, not taught necessarily in the, in the classrooms. Because, again, there's such. The thing about Ital Italy is there's such a rich culture of Italian literature, even contemporary 20th century Italian literature, uh, that, uh, that the schools are probably using. Uh, right, so they, they may not have a spot for, mm -hmm. for Shakespeare. Now, we talked about the, the relevance. If you were uh, on the National Committee to set the Common Core, mm -hmm. what Shakespeare plays would you mandate mm -hmm. for all students to learn in the United States? Well, the, the Common Core, uh, actually listed Shakespeare by name and they were the only, he was the only author that they listed by name that should be taught in the, in the curriculum uh, and uh, it depends I mean it depends on the level so if it's if you're doing it in, uh, in middle school for instance we recommend some of the light comedies uh, a play like the comedy of errors which is which is silly and, and just fun uh, and short uh, and 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 easily uh, Digested, Midsummer Night's Dream as well, uh, and then for for older grades, certainly Macbeth. Uh, Macbeth is the shortest tragedy, so it's kind of doable as opposed to Hamlet, which is the longest tragedy. So so it's uh, it's best to uh, to figure out what grade level it's going to be at. I think because it, it it really changes. Okay, but those three you feel would be uh, mm -hmm. you know, sure the first three to start with. Mm -hmm. uh, but and but the comedies are really important, and I think. Teachers don't teach the comedies very often, but, but they're great to teach. And, and again, kids can relate much better to, to marriage and to, uh, and, you know, and courtship than they can to kings and, you know, assassinations and stuff. So, so that's why we, we recommend the comedies a lot, too. Twelfth Night is, is really one that we recommend a lot. Okay, yeah. wonderful. So, uh, let's get to your... Italian heritage. Surely. Let's talk about that. Why don't you talk about your Italian background and, 
your Italian upbringing? So, yeah, so my four grandparents uh, all came to this country uh, in the early part of the 20th century uh, from Sicily. Uh, my, uh, my father's parents were from a town called San Cataldo uh, in, in Sicily, and my mother's family, her, her, both of her parents came from a town called Colisano. Uh, so, uh, so, yeah, so, and, and of course they came to Brooklyn. Uh, they met there, or they, I'm, we're not sure exactly how, because they were single when they came. Uh, and, um, and all my, you know, so, so that's, that's the history, that's the short version of the history. How old were they when they came over? They were probably teenagers, I believe. Teenagers. Yeah. Right around the 1900s, or would you say? Like, yeah, well, a little later, maybe, about 19, yeah, pro probably 1903, 1904, or in that area, I think. Which is the main yep. period of Italian immigration right. to the United States right. between 18 and so I went to the Ellis Island website and, and did some digging and uh, actually got the manifest, the ship manifest for when uh, all, both of the, both sides came over, uh, in, including the the the, uh, the boat that they came on and uh, and the pictures of the boat and, and the times and where where in New York they were going, who they who they had some kind of a connection to. Uh, it was it was just fascinating. Uh, one of the things that's sort of interesting about my father's father. Um, is, uh, as I said, he came from uh, a town called San Cataldo, uh, and his name is listed on that registry, and ultimately that was his name that he had his whole life, although he never used it, uh, is Cataldo. So, so my sense is that when he came over here, somebody, somebody well-meaning person at Ellis Island said, what's your name? And he said, San Cataldo, <laughs> thinking they asked him where he's from. Uh, and so they just wrote down Cataldo, and on all of his documents it says Cataldo, Frank, his middle name, Lamonico, and he, he only went by Frank. That was his, that was his name. Well, there, there is, uh, I know people named Cataldo. Oh, do you? Yes. They so were probably next, they were probably in line probably. with him. <laughs> but, you know, they, that is a legitimate Italian name. Yeah. But I know for Italians of that era, they wanted to make a separation from their Italian uh, nationality. They wanted to be American. They wanted to speak English. They wanted to be as American as possible. So it's very possible that his name was Cataldo, but he wanted to be known as Frank rather than Cataldo because it was much more Americanized. I know, like, in, in my family, you know, Sette Ducati is the, the, the Italian version, but many of my relatives go by the name Seti. Sure, and sure. It's, it's just a lot easier for the American tongue to say that rather than the, the Italian. Don't know. I don't know. I mean, that's interesting. And of course, I don't remember him enough, you know, to, to certainly didn't, never had that kind of conversation with him. And, he, and, and you, as you pointed out, many of them tried to, to become uh, anglicized, if you will, and become, you know, much more American. Uh, but uh, he, and he certainly didn't. I mean, he never spoke English that I remember. Wow. Well, very little of it, very little of it, I think. So you do uh, remember him as a child? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but he died when I was pretty young. And, yeah. yeah. That's, that's great. So, uh, what kind of Italian uh, heritage uh, customs did, did you practice in, as you were growing up, if any? Italian customs? Oh, well, it was about family, right? So, so when we moved, my, my, uh, my father's family, they lived on, uh, in, in East New York, on a street called Pine Street, and my mother's family lived a block away down the block on Pine Street. And so, so when we moved, we moved in the in the fifties to Long Island, uh, my family to Huntington. But every Sunday we were back in in Brooklyn, uh, and we would spend time on one you know with one part of the family, and then we would move down the block and spend time with the other part of the family. So it was it was maybe coffee and dessert at one, and, and dinner at the other, mm -hmm. and it was something we got in the car every single Sunday and did that. So it was really about family, and that was the the key, which is which is the wonderful part about uh, our heritage, I think. Is that the, the, emphasis, the importance of family? Yeah. Now, have those values that, that you learned as a child has, has that influenced you in the present day in any way? Well, I would like it to be, but <laughs> but life changes, and and so uh, and I don't know if, if if it's the same with you, but uh, uh, the the idea of a Sunday dinner with everybody comes to Grandpa's house, 
it's pretty rare. My, my, you know, my, my sons and his family live in Georgia, so they, they're not coming on a Sunday. And my daughter uh, and her husband live in Huntington, but they have their own lives and friends and, you know, and, and stuff. So it's sort of broken down. Um, it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate because that was really important to me. Uh, food particularly is important to me. I mean, I love ceremonies or things about food, so we try to do that as often as we can. But. I know you're a good cook, too. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. So we, so we did a survey a few years ago. I did a survey of, we had like 700 teachers from across the country, uh, and we wanted to know what plays were the most taught. Uh, and so Romeo and Juliet is number one. Uh, Macbeth is number two. Julius Caesar is number three. And uh, Hamlet is number four. Uh, number five is A Midsummer Night's Dream. Uh, so the first four are all tragedies, and the only comedy there is Midsummer Night's Dream. But those are the most taught. Uh, so I think, I think Romeo and Juliet is probably something that every student goes through. Mike, our cameraman would like to know. Uh, <laughs> there's a, a controversy that's been going on, I guess, for quite a while. That Shakespeare never wrote his plays, and that uh, other historical figures did. What do you feel about that, and what's the Folgers' position on that? Well, it's, it's the only real position on that. I mean, it's the only sane position on that, uh, is that, of course, he was the only writer. He wrote the plays. Uh, and the way they have figured this out is they've uh, analyzed the, the, the way the sentences are, the word choice, and, et cetera. So, Mike, uh, with so many of his plays set in Italy, what uh, point of view or what portrayal of Italy emerges. Well, th you know, there's the plays like Julius Caesar, which, you know, it's not too good for Julius Caesar. You know, I mean, Italy is a very romantic place, and in many of the plays, it's, it's you know, they talk about the beauty of it. Uh, well, Mike, it's been wonderful talking to you about Shakespeare, uh, and hopefully uh, you'll get a chance to uh, bring some of your expertise to an Italian school or an Italian university in the future. And, Get an all expenses paid vacation. Well, I just I just talked to my friends from the Bahamas. So I'm going to the Bahamas in the, in October to do exactly that to teach to do work up there. So that'll be fun. Uh, yeah, I'd like I'd like that. Well, thank you, Mike. It's great. Nice to see you.